Let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. And I'm so pleased to present my colleague and friend, Dr. Elizabeth Harry. She is the Senior Director of Clinical Affairs at the University of Colorado Hospital, where she's also an Associate Professor. Uh, today, she'll be sharing with us her work on uh, physician task load and the risk of burnout among US physicians in a national sample in the national survey, excuse me. I always call this, or why does my brain hurt so much at the end of the day? So she's gonna help shed light on that question. It's a study that was published in the Joint Commission Journal on Quality and Patient Safety in 2020. And it also got an award at a hospital, at a national hospitalist meeting, uh, a national award there. So congratulations, Liz, for that. Um, she's the first author for the study that she'll be uh, speaking to, and I was fortunate to be one of her co-authors. Um, and as a parenthetical note, I think this is an apt journal for the study, um, as cognitive workload uh, impacts quality and safety, uh, as well as burnout. So, Dr. Harry, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinski. I'm so excited to be here uh, with all of you today to talk about this study. So uh, we did, I got to partner with um, many incredible colleagues to look at uh, physician task load specifically in this situation and the risk of burnout. And we looked at US physicians in a large national study. So um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about that, that uh, study that we did and hopefully have a robust um, discussion via your Q&A uh, questions around how we can all uh, work together to try to decrease task load in our work environment. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to talk about three main things. So first, what is cognitive load? I think there's sort of an intuitive sense of what is cognitive load, but there's actually a definition and it's an entire field of study in uh, psychology of education actually. So it has a lot to do with how we learn and retain information and then also act on that information. We're gonna talk about the relationship between physician task load specifically and we'll define what that means and burnout. And then we're gonna talk about how we can uh, decrease one particular type of cognitive load uh, that is very burdensome called extraneous cognitive load. So by the end of this, you're gonna be very familiar with the different types of cognitive load and you are gonna be ready to go out there and reduce all the extraneous cognitive load that you can find. So the first thing I'm curious, and, and we can do this through the chat, but when we say the phrase cognitive load, I just want you to take a moment and sort of reflect and think about what comes to mind uh, when you hear the term cognitive load. And so we can wait for a couple um, chat answers to come through, but I'm just curious what, what sort of common definition you have for yourself. So we're gonna do the long pause until we get like one or two. <laughs> And so, Chris, I don't know if you're seeing any or if you can sort of speak to um, what what you hear from people when they talk about this kind of conceptually. Yes. Yeah, so the chat is actually blown up with ideas that people okay. have um, brain power to do something, multitasking, making a decision, having to think too hard to do simple tasks, having to make mental switches often and not being able to focus and all the many things to think about at one time. So there's, there are more, uh, here's another one, uh, brain energy extracted, uh, things that wake me up at three in the morning. <laughs> they keep coming, but this is, that gives you a flavor for uh, how our audience is thinking about these things. Well, so, so you guys have a very natural gestalt at what this is. And so we're gonna kind of go through this, but, but you're hitting on a lot of the extraneous cognitive load. Um, and so we'll go through that and, and some of the environmental factors that make it harder to focus where we want to. So in order to talk about cognitive load, we need to step back and we need to talk about something called working memory. And so this is something that I want you to learn by the end of this is what is working memory. So in order to learn something, you have to use your short-term working memory. And in order to do something, you have to use your short-term working memory. So everything that comes in from the environment into your long-term working memory passes through your short-term working memory and everything that comes out from your knowledge, from your long-term uh, memory has to go through that short-term working memory. So it's like the gatekeeper and unfortunately it's limited. <laughs> so it is a finite resource. Um, and, and I think that's a really important concept because we don't always act like it's finite in healthcare. So I want you to think of it like a cup and it's a cup that gets full, filled and we're gonna talk about what fills it up. Um, 
The other thing that I want you to, to realize is that their physiologic and emotional stress can both decrease the size of that cup or the size of that box. So your working memory can be decreased. You can't really expand it beyond sort of baseline, but we'll talk about different techniques to restore it. Um, but certainly working memory does get uh, decreased during emotional and physiologic stress. Most people have heard the phrase, you can remember five to nine items that comes from working memory. So you can actually hold about five to nine items simultaneously in your working memory, but you can only act on about two to four. And you can listen to about two and a half conversations at once, it turns out. Um, and so I think this concept of a finite resource of working memory that is the gatekeeper for everything that comes in through the senses and everything that needs to come out through our long-term memory is very important to the concept of cognitive load. So then when we're thinking about this box of working memory, how, how do we know how much of it is full at any given time? Well, there's three things that impact how much of our working memory is full, and this is cognitive load theory. So this is popularized by John Sweller, who's an Australian psychologist, and it's in the field of educational psychology, because that's where we think about how do we get information into people's brain and have it stick for a long time. But it turns out it's important in healthcare too, because we want to learn and we also need to be able to act on that information effectively. So the three things that impact how much of your working memory are used at any given time is one is intrinsic load. So how hard is the thing that you're working on? So if I'm doing a discharge summary on a very complex patient, that's high intrinsic load. I can't change that. That is what it is. If I'm playing Play-Doh with my kid on the floor, lower intrinsic load. I don't need to be as focused to make sure that I do it safely. Now, arguably, I want to be focused for different reasons, um, but the intrinsic load of the task is less. And so it takes up less of my working memory. The extraneous load is how hard do I have to work to complete the task? How much energy do I need to work to getting all the pieces of information that I need to complete the task? And how divided is my attention? So everything that splits my attention every time I'm interrupted, everything that lacks standardization. So every time I need to approach a task and learn how to do the task while I'm also doing the task. So if I go to one unit in the hospital and it's organized this way, and I go to another unit and it's organized this way, or their interdisciplinary rounds follow this process on one unit and this process on another unit, I have to use part of my working memory to think about the process in addition to the content. So extraneous cognitive load is bad. We, we want to minimize that as much as possible. And then germane load is really good. How much of your working memory do you spend learning the information about how to complete the task? So this is your level of expertise. If you have a high degree of expertise at, comp at completing a task, your germane load will be very low. If you have a low level of expertise, if you're a medical student or a trainee, your germane load will be very high. And what's important to realize is that that box that we talked about gets full when you add intrinsic extraneous and germane load. And so just if we were to think about a learner for a second, if they're doing a complex task, let, let's say a hospital discharge, and they have high germane load because they're learning the task and they're learning some of the content, if the extraneous load is also high, they're getting a lot of pages, a lot of interruptions, the risk of them overloading and, and going outside of that box is very high. And what happens when that happens is called load shedding. And what that means is you start losing pieces of data and you're completely unaware that you've lost it. And this puts us at risk for medical errors. So when we think about the bad kind of cognitive load, so extraneous cognitive load, there's three main offenders. So the things that make extraneous cognitive load high are lack of standardization. And we talked a little bit about that. So if every clinic room you go into is organized differently, you're using some of your extraneous cognitive load to process, okay, where do I find this tool? Where do I find this tool? If I want to learn about my patient's diabetes, but I don't have one nice screen in my EHR that shows me everything, but I need to go to one screen to see their home glucose regimen. I need to go to another screen to see what insulin they've gotten in the hospital and yet a third screen to see what their continuous monitor up readings show in, in the um, EHR, I'm spending a lot of time consolidating that information myself. So, so trying to go find all those pieces or that split attention um, is, is a huge cost of extraneous load. Another way that attention can be split is if you're interrupted. So you're working on a task and you get paged and maybe the urgency isn't super high, but we haven't really defined what our, with our teams, what qualifies as high enough urgency to interrupt a cognitive process. 
And so I get paged and pulled away to address something. And then I go back and it takes me 90 seconds every time that happens to recollect my focus. That's called an attentional blink. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later um, to to uh, gather my attention back to where I was. And then the third one, and this is tricky in medicine, but it's actually redundancy is the um, the third sort of main offender in cognitive load. And redundancy is when you're given the same information multiple times, um, or um, there's a lot of redundancy in the system. So I'll give you an example. My mom saw sort of a skin cancer expert, and she, she you know, he was doing this very high level stuff for her skin cancer. And she said, well, I don't understand why when I'm there, he can't also do my full skin check. Well, he can also do her full skin check because that would build so much redundancy in the system that we have all of these people doing full skin checks when really what we need him to do is this super high level thing that only he can do. And we have lots of people that can do the skin check. So these increased redundancies in the system, while we think they're protective and while we think they increase access, they actually make us much less efficient and they contribute to cognitive load. So cognitive load, it turns out you can measure. So NASA has been thinking about this for a really long time. They're very aware that your attention is a finite resource, that it can be overloaded. And when it is overloaded, people make mistakes. They have a great uh, review, which I will share with you in a second, um, uh, called Stress Performance and Cognition, where they go through all of the literature on how stress impacts people's performance and ability to think. And so they built the NASA Task Load Index. It has six subscales. How hard is something mentally, physically? How much time did it take you? How frustrated did you feel after doing it? How much effort did it take you? And how did you perceive your performance to be? This task load um, index was developed over a three year cycle and they had 40 laboratory simulations. And since it has been um, validated in over, for 30 years in multiple industries, including aviation, there's multiple healthcare studies using this tool. It's free, you can all go use it. There's actually a lovely app so you can just download it on your iPad and use it in studies very easily. Um, and so I just wanted to share, and I'll pause on, on this um, slide for a second so you can take out your phones um, and take a picture of the QR code, but I have um, just a Google Doc with a lot of nice references for cognitive loads so that you can save them um, and you can be able to share them or, or look at them later. And that includes the NASA um, Stress Performance and Cognition article, which is great. So I'll leave that up for just a moment more give you a chance to capture that. So now we're going to talk about physician task load and burnout. So we talked about, okay, what is cognitive load? And I think intuitively, you know, a lot of you spoke to this in the comments. And our question was, is there a relationship between this task load for physicians and burnout? And if there's a relationship, how strong is it? So um, in order to do the study, we used the AMA master file and we surveyed um, the physician sample from the AMA master file, um, we got a 17.8 response rate, um, percent response rate. So we got about 5,400 responses out of the 30,000 30, roughly physicians. Um, and so we used several measures. So we used um, the Maslach burnout inventory to measure burnout. And we qualified someone as burnt out if they had a high score on the depersonalization or emotional exhaustion sub subscale or both. Um, and then we used the NASA task load index. Uh, to measure physician task load. And I wanna share that we actually pulled, we used all six in the study, but we ended up pulling four domains out and calling them the physician task load. So effort, mental, physical, and temporal demands. The reason that we pulled frustration and performance out is because when we analyzed the subdomains, those two actually tracked with burnout and so would confound our um, results to actually be more, more favorable to have a stronger correlation with burnout. And we didn't want that confounding. So it seems that the frustration and the performance measure might actually be indirect measures of burnout. So we took those out. Um, there's another nurse's study that did the same thing and actually found the same thing. So the four domains that make up the physician task load are effort, mental, physical, and temporal demand. Uh, demand. And so we then broke the physician task load into quintiles. And for those physicians that were in the top quintile of physician task load in their report, thinking about the last two weeks of their clinical life, uh, their rate of reporting burnout was 68%. 
As compared to those that were in the bottom quintile of physician task load, their rate of reporting burnout was 22%. So pretty significant difference between, and you can see uh, the stats on there, so it was definitely significant difference between the top quintile and the bottom quintile of physician task load and the risk of burnout. So then we were wondering, well, what is the dose response here? And, and in theory, what impact could we have? And so we looked at for every 10% change in the physician task load score, there was a 33% corresponding change in the odds of reporting burnout in the same direction. So if the physician task load score went down by 10%, um, the odds of reporting burnout went down by 33%. And if the physician task load score went up by 10%, the odds of reporting burnout went up by 33%. Now, this isn't causal, it's a correlation, but it's suggestive that perhaps there's a relationship there. And also it's suggestive that little changes in physician task load can have a large impact on risk of burnout, which I think is optimistic and, and um, says that further studies could be done to look at if you actually lower physician task load by a certain amount, how much do you lower uh, physician burnout? So I just wanna share this. This is um, the four domains as well as the sum by specialty. I do wanna draw attention to that the sum for statistical reasons isn't if you just take the four numbers and add it up because with missing numbers, the denominator was different. So it's not exactly like that. Um, there's statistical nuance to, to why the numbers are not exactly the sum, um, but this was the proper way to report it. And then this is a heat map sorted from the highest sum physician task load all the way down to the lowest. Um, and, and so you can notice emergency medicine a specialty where there's a lot of split attention, um, there can be a lot of extraneous cognitive load, and there's obviously a lot of um, intrinsic co cognitive load as well, had the highest overall um, physician task load score. The other thing that you'll notice is that the different domains, while there's some variation, they tend to cluster together among specialties. There's some obviously variation a little bit lower with physical demand standing out, but for the most part, that they cluster together. So what did we find in our study? So this was the first large study to look at physician task load and burnout. Um, certainly we need further studies, so you guys can, can think about participating in these, but further studies to demonstrate causality. So we know that these things are correlated. I think it's intuitive that they're correlated, but now we've demonstrated that there are, and we need to look at causal relationships. Um, and we also need to um, evaluate the dose response. So we need to evaluate if you impact physician task load this much, how much is it gonna impact burnout? Um, we also found that, so the task load index is very easy to use. It's extremely well validated. It's a short tool um, and it's very easy by putting it on the iPad or the iPhone using the app. We found that the physician task load strongly associates with the risk of burnout. So um, the next step would be focused interventions and trying to see if you could decrease the task load, do you decrease burnout? And then also monitoring both over time. So looking at physician task load over time. One thing that would be interesting, I think, is looking at physician task load at different parts during the pandemic. I suspect, I don't know how you all feel, but I feel like mine went up quite a bit um, during the pandemic. And, and then um, the physician task load clearly is demonstrated by that um, heat map varied by specialty and by setting. And I think what's important to think about there is that there's probably um, specialties that are doing particularly particular things well, where they're able to protect some of that cognitive thinking time um, and maybe bright spots that we could look at and try to better understand um, what is it that they do well, that they have a lower physician task load. The other thing that we found is, for example, psychiatry has a higher risk of burnout intrinsic in the specialty in our study, um, but the lower physician task load in that uh, specialty seemed to offset or be a protective factor um, for that specialty. And so thinking about using physician task load as a way to offset other inherent um, uh, risk factors for burnout is, an, is another way to think about this. So I wanna pause there and, and do another sort of interactive um, space. Now that you guys understand extraneous cognitive load, I wanna know what the largest sources of, of extraneous cognitive load are where you work. So I'm very curious to hear that. So there is no lack of response here either. And, and I'll read you a few. Constant interruptions. Um, <laughs> inbox, I'm not even sure if I have the right word here, but uh, obviously the inbox 
uh, maybe that is meant to be redundancies, uh, staff needs, desktop management, the EHR, EHR and internal mess messaging, EHR, pre-op. Uh, I put my own in there, uh, EHR, clerical work, especially CPOE. Um, economic demands, workload, no quiet place to work. So I think there is no problem finding uh, large sources of extraneous cognitive load among our experienced audience. Absolutely. And what I think is kind of exciting about that is um, with the ability to identify it, you can now think about, and we'll talk about solutions next, but you can now think about both from leadership positions that you have all the way down to your individual life, how you're going to modify um, some of these uh, sources of extraneous load for yourself and then also for the workplace. So that begs the question of how can we reduce physician task load? So there are some things we can't reduce, like the intrinsic load, and, and we don't want to, right? That's it's a hard job and there's hard, hard cognitive pieces of it. And that's part of why a lot of us went into it. Um, and we also want to maximize that germane load. So we need to be learning all the time. We need to be integrating new information about our patients, about new studies coming out. So we need to make space for that learning process. And in order to do that, the offender is get rid of the extraneous cognitive load. So of course, this is the goal, right? That we're sitting at the bedside of our patient and we're able to be contemplative and we're able to really notice those subtle things that maybe contribute to our heuristics and our ability to make decisions that way. And that we have time to think and do that sort of deep, uh, deep work and deep thought process. So again, we're gonna go through those three things. So I, I, I want this to be sort of uh, habitual for you by the end of this talk. So um, standardization, redundancy and split attention. Um, and so in terms of increasing uh, standardization, so I want you to think about this in as many ways as you can. And um, in order to do this, I want you to think about Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs wore the same outfit every day. Why did he do that? Well, he did that because if you do that, you don't have to think about what you're going to wear every day. That is one less decision that you have to make. So he took that off, off the plate. The other piece is, um, that's really important to know is that every habit you make, and when you standardize something, it turns into a habit, uh, because you do it routinely, every habit you make comes out of that short term working memory box, and it goes into long term working memory. And to date, we do not know of any limitation in long term working memory. In other words, you can develop as many habits and routines as as you would like. Um, and, and so I think it's important to be mindful of our habits and make sure they're all ones that sort of serve us. But you can actually intentionally build habits and routines where you always come home, you put your keys here, you always see a patient in a certain way. Many of us have habits in the way we do physical exam. We always do it in the same way to make sure we don't miss anything. Those routines are really important because it takes the information from the short-term working memory where your medical student is and they're thinking about the physical exam and they're thinking about every piece to a habit and a routine where you just go through and then you're looking for differences and you're looking for that subtlety and that's what your brain is processing rather than how to go through the different steps. So standardize everything that you can across units and hospitals. If I have to tell you, so I called John Sweller at one point um, to make sure that it was okay with him that I was applying his theory in this way. And we were having a conversation and he said, wait, are you trying to tell me that every hospital in the United States organizes themselves differently? And I said, no. And he said, oh, thank goodness. And I said, I'm trying to tell you that every unit and every hospital in the United States organizes themselves differently. And he was horrified. And he said, why would they do that? It's so dangerous. And it's because we don't know and we're not attending to these things. But in the, in the ideal world, you would walk onto a unit, it would be uh, organized exactly the same as the next unit. So you wouldn't have to spend time thinking about how to do some of these things. I want you to think central line kits. There's a reason those things really help. Um, across processes, how, how do we admit a patient? How do we discharge a patient? How do we transfer a patient from this floor to this floor? How do we hand off a patient? Um, across teams and providers. So, you know, is it okay that I do it this way and I expect everybody on the team to sort of modify to that, but then the next attending comes on and they do it differently and now everybody on the team has to modify to that? Probably not. It's, it's a high source of extraneous load for them. Um, I actually have a fellow that just studied this in the ICU and she found that variability in attending style um, and expectation was a source of extraneous load for uh, the trainees that were trying to also manage this high degree of intrinsic and germane load. And then also in your personal life. So how do you manage the EHR? When you're reviewing a patient in the EHR, do you go through the data in the same way every time? So you make sure you don't miss anything. What um, standardization and routines can you add to that? Um, 
the one thing I'll say here is that there is tension here with customization, right? So, so part of what many of our EHRs allow you to do is have a lot of customization of how you get to different windows. I don't know about you guys, but my particular EHR, there's about 10 ways I can get to the same data. And when I watch my trainees, they all do it differently. Um, and so, you know, cognitive load theory would argue that that is terrible and that there should be one way to do it. Um, we also want to respect expertise and make sure that we don't standardize to the degree that people can't add their nuanced skill set to things. And so I think there's a tension there and we need to think about that and, and have discussions about that. So decreasing redundancy, and I am super aware that this is going to hit a nerve in healthcare. We always put up the Swiss cheese model, right? And we put up all these things and then we have errors that go through and we say, so we need to have so many layers so that an error never happens. But if you think about high reliability organizations, they don't have seven different ways that they do the process every time. They have one highly reliable way that they do the process every time. So if I have a patient with positive blood cultures, and sometimes I get notified by my trainee, sometimes I get notified by the nurse, sometimes I get a call from the lab, but sometimes they call the nurse and sometimes they call my trainee, and sometimes I see it in, in an epic flag, those aren't reliable sources. So if one of those is missing one time, I'm not going to notice that. If there was one way that I got notified of that critical thing every single time and you didn't have that process happen, it would be a lot easier to evaluate the process. So I know a lot of times that we think, you know, the more redundancy, the better, but it can actually get like having multiple carabiners when, when rock climbing, it can actually get to the point where it's actually cumbersome and it makes it harder to get the job done. So um, I want you to think about that. Um, and how you get the information, how you get the data. So again, if there's six different ways that I can get the same information and I'm using six different ways every time, then I'm using extraneous cognitive load every time to get that data. And then delegate. So um, you don't need everybody in the process doing the same tasks. There's a lot of redundancy there and, and that uses extraneous cognitive load. If you have one or two people in the process doing certain tasks and then these people doing different tasks, and sort of top of license activity there, um, then people can get very focused and routinized on what they're doing rather than it's sort of a free for all and every, there's a lot of redundancy in what people are doing. And then finally, um, consolidating data and reducing split attention. So I want you to think about when you were told a story and you had all the pieces of information you needed to act versus when you were told a story in a very disorganized way and maybe pieces of the end came. I mean, some novels are written this way and it's enjoyable, but it definitely takes more energy to put the whole story together. I, I know that I can think of medical student presentations where everything is where it needs to be and, and it's in the order it needs to be. And I know exactly what's going on with that patient at the end or other times when data is all over the place. And sometimes some of the assessment is in with the data and, all, and it's very disorganized and it takes more cognitive energy to understand what's going on. So the idea here is that you bring everything you need for a workflow together in one space. So this is the idea of central line kits, um, that you have everything that you need right there. Um, also, this is the idea in many EHRs, there are certain disease state tabs now where you can click on a diabetes screen and it has everything I would need to think about for my patient for diabetes right there. Or I can click on a sepsis screen and it has everything I would need to think about during sepsis right there. So I'm not wasting time trying to find the lactate and then going back to micro to find the blood cultures, but it's all right there. So that's all, those are all examples of decreasing um, split attention by consolidating the data. Um, part of this is process coupling too, and that's part of um, the making routines and making habits. So as much as you can couple processes together and make them partner together routinely that that always happens, then you'll be able to make that um, a habit. And then you know, one of the things that Team Steps really does, which came out of aviation, is to have an agreement among your team of what warrants an interruption. Um, so it can't just be like, I had a thought, and so I'm going to come talk to you about that thought. And that's sort of what email and text and all that has uh, turned into. But just because someone else has a thought doesn't mean it is the moment that we need to talk about it. And in fact, it may be interrupting a very crucial cognitive process. So let's have a discussion about what warrants interrupting that crucial cognitive process. And actually in aviation, when, when they do this, the person who interrupts takes the responsibility of getting the person who was thinking about something else back to where they needed to be. So they would come up and listen a little bit and they would say, I need to interrupt you. I have something very important. What are you talking about right now? Oh, well, we were talking about Mr. So-and-so's blood pressure. Okay, so I need to interrupt you about this and we talked about that. Now we're all done. 
thank you so much. I want to remind you, you were talking about Mr. So-and-so's blood pressure. I may actually take that onus to help get the person back to where they were and reduce that attentional blink. Um, and then as much as possible, and I'm a hospitalist, so this exists very little in my life, but as much as possible, having blocks of uninterrupted work where you can sit and you can focus. This is why that Pomodoro block uh, method works where you sort of do 25 minutes of work, five minutes of rest. And we'll talk about another reason that that works really well. So whose responsibility is it to work on all these things? So everybody. <laughs> so you can work on these things individually in your life. You can think about what are your routines when you leave for work? How do you get to work? What do you wear? What does your sort of entire work entire workflow at home look like to get you and anyone else you need to get out of the house look like? And similarly, when you come home, what does that look like? And what routines and systems can you build there to try to reduce it, um, extraneous cognitive load? Work units, what can you do within teams to make agreements about interruptions, to standardize processes? Organizational factors, how can we as an organization say, okay, we have seven different methods of interdisciplinary rounds across this hospital. Let's talk about standardizing that. Let's find a best practice. Um, and then national factors. So, you know, a lot of the extraneous cognitive load is due to EHR, as, as a lot of you talked about, and a lot of the EHR is billing and, and just filling in um, necessary parts. I'll tell you, we do um, a method at my institution called APSO instead of SOAP notes. So we do assessment plan and then uh, subjective and objective. And part of the reason we do that is because most of what we need from each other is in the assessment and the plan. Um, and the subjective and objective is mostly billing information and it's stuff that becomes very long and people are scrolling through. And that's part of why we've done that. But national advocacy around, do we really need to put all these pieces in our notes because it's making it a lot harder for us to function would be uh, really important. And just to speak to that sort of individual versus team-based tension, you know, when we look at burnout, they have compared when you do individual versus systemic interventions, and they did they did a meta-analysis looking at 20 controlled studies with over 1,500 physicians, and they looked at sort of individual interventions to help people and organizational-focused interventions um, to help, and, and the, there was significant improvement uh, treatment effects in burnout uh, for the organization-focused interventions. And so I think it's really important to say we have agency and there are things we can do for ourselves, and we should, but we definitely want to be advocates and look at how we can do this at the organizational level. But to give you some resources for the individual level, so these are three of, some of, um, three of my favorite books. So Deep Work really talks about how do you get into that space where you're able to focus, you're able to do really deep work um, and to block out some of that time to make sure that you're giving that best work. Um, essentialism, one of my favorite things that this book says is that the word priorities is an oxymoron because you actually can't have more than one priority. But the idea here is like, what are the top three things that you need to get done today? Or what is the top thing that needs to happen for this patient today? And how do we make that happen and get rid of sort of a, a lot of the other um, ext extraneous load um, or noise? Another way to look at this is sort of signal to noise. And I talk to my trainees about that a lot. And then one of my favorite books, just sort of for your personal mind and, and your your home life is the organized mind. And it gives a ton of tips about how we process information and how to organize your life so that it makes it easier for you to maximize uh, the amount of data and information you can process and just not feel completely exhausted at the end of the day. But I think the key take home point here is that contrary to how we behave, uh, your attention is a limited resource and you need to protect it. You are the only person that is going to protect it um, and in the end has any ownership over it. Um, and so it is really important to protect it. Um, I love the recent New England Journal um, perspective piece around attention that was written um, actually by my boss here, um, looking at that tension between attention and availability. And the idea being that we wanna be really available and we wanna be available for the right things, but if we don't have space to actually give proper attention to things, we're gonna start making mistakes and we're not gonna give our best care and we're not gonna give the care that you or I would want or that we would want for our family members. So we need to be really cognizant of this. Um, one of the best ways to function cognitively is to use up your working memory with a task. So that would be that 25 minutes of focused attention. And then you take a break so that that working memory uh, is able to replete and all that cognitive load goes away. And then, and there was actually just a paper that came out by John Sweller that shows that that actually happens. So when you take that break, you are able to replete that working memory. Um, and then you attend to something with focused attention again. That is the, the optimal way 
to do work. What most of us do instead is what's called continuous partial attention. So all day long, we continually partially attend to multiple things at the same time. We never take that opportunity to have that break to restore our working memory. And by the time we get home at the end of the day, we don't know what to make for dinner because we're so, our, our working memory is so depleted and hasn't been restored at all. Um, and the other thing that I would highlight is that multitasking is a myth. Um, there are people, and myself included, that think they're good multitaskers, but you're not. It's been well studied. And what you're doing is called task switching. So you're going from one task to the next and back again and back again. And every time you do that, you lose that 90 seconds of data or that attentional blink that we talked about. That is an incredibly inefficient way uh, to live your day. So something that you want to be very mindful of. Um, I, another book that I love is called Designing Your Life. And I just want to put a plug in here that, you know, we have agency here. We can think outside the box. We can design all sorts of careers and different lives to make sure that we are spending our attention in ways that reflects our values um, and in ways that um, creates a fulfilling and meaningful life for us. So we don't have to wait for the entire external world to change to do that for us. We have a lot of control over that. And, and so just thinking about, you know, you can think about where you work and do they share your values? You can think about how much do you work and, and what income do you want to live on? Um, delegate, say no, um, and really work on maximizing your personal efficiency by having as many routines as possible. Um, and then spend that attention on something that brings you a sense of meaning and purpose. Focus on the people in your life and things that really um, fill you up and bring is the reason you came to your, your job. Um, and, and then thinking about that work-life integration and, and priorities so that you do have energy and attention left when you get home um, for the people that matter for you there as well. Um, because again, we want to build these really high-functioning teams like this Peloton of bikers, but we also need to make sure that we're building a situation where we're, we are really balanced. And in the end, nobody else is going to take responsibility uh, for that than us. So it is really important for us to focus on that. So um, with that, I will stop. I'm happy to go through questions. Um, please reach out if you have any questions. Um, here's my contact information. And I'm happy to chat with anyone. So Dr. Harry, thank you so much for that. I think we could all listen to that a couple of times and learn more and more each time. And I found myself looking back over my 32 years of practice and having a new framework for understanding some of the pain points and some of the success uh, stories within how we developed and organized our practice. And one of the most powerful success stories and one of the most powerful interventions I've seen traveling the country is advanced team-based care with in-room support where the physician is able to, like in the portrait you showed, give their undivided attention to the patient mm -hmm. while a clinical assistant is doing real-time visit note documentation and order entry. And I wonder if you can um, speak to that through this lens of both the redundancy in the system, but also the um, avoidance of task switching. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect, right? Because from, from a focused attention standpoint, then the physician can go in and spend the time on the intrinsic load. So the thing that is hard about the task and figure out the puzzle, and then also hopefully a little germane load, right? Maybe learn from their patients and, and learn something from that experience that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. Meanwhile, you have um, someone else and it is not extraneous load to them because for them it is the intrinsic load of the task that they are working on who is giving their focused attention to documenting what's happening versus I'm trying to give focused attention to a patient and then I'm trying to give focused attention to documentation and back and forth and back and forth, losing 90 seconds of data in the meantime and infuriating my patient because they don't feel like I'm present. So I think it's the perfect solution. Right, and we don't ask our lawyers and judges to simultaneously do their legal work and create the legal record. And it's probably time to stop asking physicians to do that. I, I also thought about um, the myth of the superhero, which I think all physicians labor under um, mm -hmm. at this point. And we may actually realize that we are not superhero, but the system approaches us as if we are. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about admitting patients through the ER and the beepers here and the EMS squawk box and the other guy dictating into the phone right next to me and the nurse coming in with other patients' um, data. And so I wonder if you can just speak a little bit more to uh, that experience through the lens of uh, task load. 
Yeah, so so many thoughts, but I'll, I'll tell you that I, I had the good pleasure on one of my studies of getting to partner with a consultant from NASA who thinks about this all the time. And she actually came to shadow me uh, at work because um, she was very curious. And she was horrified by the number of sort of noises and interruptions and all these things. And, and I mean, you could see just her whole world um, being turned upside down that we were doing such a high risk thing with all of these interruptions coming in. So I think from a cognitive load standpoint, there's that piece of, of this idea that our attention is infinite and we can just process and absorb infinitely and we can't. So there's that piece. But the other piece that ties into this is um, also the superhero piece about burnout, right? So this idea that I don't get affected by this. I don't get exhausted by the end of the day. I don't get burnt out or I don't get depressed. And so I won't reach out for help, right? And I think both of those, I think those wound us on both sides. I think we need to be able to say, I've hit my limit, this isn't safe. And I think we also need to say, and now I need to seek help because it's really burnt me out that I've hit my limit for so long. So there's a follow-up question in the chat from one of our uh, colleagues, Dr. Privateer, who asked, um, so how do we convince senior leaders about how important um, preserving working short-term working memory is and um, avoiding the task switching. I've added a little to what he said, but that's the question. <laughs> um, so I think it's the same way that we went through our quality journey 10 years ago, right? I think it's demonstrating that this isn't safe. And that's actually been well-documented in other industries. Um, and it's really funny also when I was talking to John Sweller about this, and we were talking about the redundancy. He said, but there are so many randomized controlled trials that show that redundancy is terrible for retaining information. I was like, I, apparently we're not reading them. So I think part of it is looking to other industries and saying, well, what have other high reliability organizations demonstrated is risky and demonstrated contributes to error. And again, that, that NASA uh, review, it's 170 pages, but it's fantastic. But the, that NASA review that I put in that QR code um, goes through that very nicely about you start, first you start sort of shedding um, things in a very um, thoughtful way. So you will lose actually lower risk data, but the more overloaded bec you become, you actually just start randomly losing data. And of course you, it's outside of your awareness so you're unaware that you're missing and losing this data. And this is very well documented. It has been very well studied. And so I think it's just about demonstrating um, the potential impact on patient safety and patient errors. And then also it ties into the burnout ROI conversation, right? That um, if, if we continue to overload people indefinitely, they're not going to be able to continue to do this job. And just one last anecdote, I'll say part of why I got interested in this is you know, I used to notice that the intern's eyes sort of at the end of the day were glazed over, right? Like totally overloaded and had that overloaded look. And then it was the resident's eyes were also glazed over. And now at the end of the day, I feel like everybody's eyes look like that, right? We've somehow created a system where everybody is completely overloaded by the end of the day. And I just don't think it's sustainable. So, so great. And um, so there's a lot of questions. Let me pivot slightly to, um, uh, a participant who asks if we can address sleep deprivation and um, meditation. Yeah, so two great questions. So sleep deprivation is physiologic stress and definitely has been shown in, a, in that um, NASA review, but has been shown to both decrease the size of your working memory um, through that, but it also decreases the amount of data that you can attend to. So through that decrease in the working memory. So that piece is really important in addition to things that we know, such as reaction time and other things. Um, and meditation, I think, is really interesting. I, I've actually asked John if he'd like to do a study on this. Um, my hypothesis, and this hasn't been proven through um, a study, but my hypothesis is that meditation, um, just like a cognitive break, gives you an opportunity to restore your working memory. The other thing that meditation does is you're training your mind on focused attention. That's what meditation is, right? You're focusing either on your breath or a mantra or on your internal dialogue or whatever your point of focus is. Um, it, but most of the methods of meditation are training in focused attention. So you're basically practicing keeping your attention in one space for a longer and longer period of time, which is important because in our society these days, we don't do that. And so we're losing the ability to sit down and focus for a long period of time. So I think related to that is a question um, someone asked, what do you suggest that people do in their five minute break? And I'm going to actually modify that to what do you do as a hospitalist in your five minute break? What should perhaps a surgeon in the OR or a, 
um, an internist in the outpatient setting do for that five minute break? Yeah. So for me, a lot of times I'll listen to music that actually really helps me. And I'll just like turn on music for a couple minutes and, and then try to look outside or if not get outside. So if I can get outside, that really helps sort of ground me and, and replenish things and, and listening to music for whatever reason just really helps clear things. Um, I do have like a million meditation apps on my phone. So sometimes I'll do a five or 10 minute meditation. Um, and I think that's really helpful. One of the things that I found really, in, I am not a surgeon, so I may totally blunder this. So if I do, surgeons tell me. But one of the things that I've always been envious about the surgical space is there's so much protection for focusing, right? And they have this music on and they're just focusing on the intrinsic load of the thing that they're doing. And I think that that's a really coveted thing to have. Um, so I don't, I don't know that it's probably safe for them to take um, a break during that. But I think because they don't have all the extraneous cognitive load or they have less, I know we call and interrupt them and maybe we should have discussions about what we interrupt them with. But I think that, um, you know, trying to, because they have the decreased extraneous cognitive load, I think that that probably is enough of a break, but they could tell me otherwise. <laughs> so um, I want to uh, connect that to other industries that you'd mentioned earlier and share what you've probably read as well. Bob Wachter talks about it in his book, The Digital Doctor. Okay. He went to Boeing, met with a team of engineers that are responsible for protecting the cockpit, particularly creating a time of a sterile cockpit during takeoff and delivery, where the number of lights and beeps and uh, distractions are really limited. And they describe a team might've worked for two years for an alarm that would help in some minor way but the team of engineers at the funnel point can say, nope, can't take that. It's not worth the extra strain. What would it look like in your fantasy world to have a similar set of uh, individuals protecting the cockpit for physicians doing their work? I, I think it's absolutely necessary. So what these industries do is they have human factors engineers. They have people that are trained to know how the design of the workplace impacts people's ability to think and do their job. And we need to have the same. And one of the questions I always ask is, is there any one person in the hospital that knows every alert that an intern is gonna get at 3 a.m. admitting a patient with sepsis? Because there is somebody that should be able to answer that question and say, they're gonna get 52 alerts as they're trying to admit that patient. You know, and maybe we decide there's a threshold at which, of course, they're gonna click right through them, right? Because we've sort of stepped over that alert fatigue state. Um, here's a question. Uh, are older phys physicians more or less resilient? Um, what about burnout by age group? Um, we do know, and I, I looked it up after I saw the question, that physicians who are over 65 have a lower rate of burnout than uh, our youngest physicians, uh, odds ratio of less than uh, 0.5. Um, but what about um, the, uh, the different forms of load, particularly the um, Germain load is probably greater. Talk about age as it relates to uh, cognitive load. Yeah, so I think there's two pieces there. So um, there's expertise. Um, and so with the expertise that develops, there's less germane load um, in, in learning about a process, but there can sometimes be expertise reversal effect, right? And so the idea is that you know something so well that then the ability to stop and integrate something new and different um, when the process has changed becomes very challenging and very difficult because you have to move up that sort of um, consciously competent or con unconsciously competent all the way back down to consciously uncompetent, right? And be very intentional and then learning again and going up through those steps um, up to back up to unconsciously competent. And so there is that expertise reversal effect. The other piece that I'll just highlight is, I think um, based on our data and other data I've seen is um, that early mid-career space has the highest um, sort of risk of burnout and, and cognitive load. And part of that I think is you know, building career, families, balancing all of these things. And there's a lot of cognitive load there. Great, great. Um, so the study suggests to me, and I think you've made this uh, uh, inference that um, there might be a root cause similarity between medical error and causes of burnout. Um, anything you wanna to speak to that? Anything further you wanna say about that? I think that, that there may be a similarity in that something that causes burnout can also put us at risk of higher 
uh, medical error. I, the literature on this is mixed, right? So there's been studies that have shown that people that self that are experienced burnout have higher rates of self-reported medical error. But then when you actually go back and do chart review and analysis, they don't have higher rates of committing medical error. Um, but one of the things that I've always thought when I looked at that data is self-reported higher rates is bad too, right? Because you're walking around thinking that you're hurting people and, and that piece is impactful too. But I think as far as this goes, I think it's a branch point. I, I don't know that it necessarily means that there's that relationship between medical error and burnout, but I think it definitely says that there is something that could put us at risk for both. Uh, and I would also suggest that there are probably cognitive errors that we make that aren't available to the chart review, but we know I didn't think about that. Oh my gosh, that was a near miss. And that was an error on my part. So I'm wondering what you think about the future uses of cognitive load. Like what's on the horizon for studying this? What, what do you want to see next? I would love to see people use um, the PTL measure, the physician task code, which you can use by doing the NASA task code and just taking off um, the, the frustration and performance, but use it in various settings and try to see what the task load is of various settings. Um, like I said, we had a study here in our um, intensive care unit, contra you know, looking at cognitive load with different attendings and different ways people round. I think looking for bright spots would be a really interesting next step and finding places that have sort of low cognitive load. Um, and then maybe try to reduce extraneous cognitive load and see if with that burnout goes down. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, uh, terrific. And um, you also alluded to this, but might we eventually find a threshold for cognitive load over above which patient care will likely suffer? And how would we go about that? I think it's highly likely. I mean, I think what we would need to do is, you know, continually start documenting uh, this physician task load in different environments. And then you could use that to correlate with medical errors in that environment. And, and then we could probably find a correlation that shows, you know, above this task load, medical errors are much more common. Um, or above this task load in a particular process, medical errors are much more common. Great, great. I think we have covered almost all the questions that are present. Is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with before um, I tell them what's next on, on the webinar series agenda? I mean, I think the only thing I would say is that first and foremost, you have to take care of you. So make sure you look at sort of a, you know, extraneous cognitive load in your own life and see what you can do to kind of reduce that because I think we all have a lot of it right now. Um, and, and then, you know, share the love and, and share it in your environments around you. Uh, terrific. Uh, Dr. Harry, it was just a pleasure to have you on. I, I'm tempted to, as I said, watch this over again and get that message even more fully incorporated into my short-term and long-term working memory. <laughs> well, thank you um, so much, Dr. Sinsky, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, it's just terrific. And I look forward to the next uh, iteration of the research that, that you do on this. Um, I'd like to share with the audience what's next. Um, and Brittany, if you'd like to bring up the slides, if that's possible, we'll do that. And my apologies for not doing that in order as you had expected. Um, but first of all, thanks so much for uh, joining us for the webinar. And we wanna let you know what's coming up next. So on March 24th, we will have Dr. Mark Renewald speak on seeking feedback like you mean it. Take time to, to action. Dr. Grenewald has uh, given two previous presentations, one on gratitude, um, and they were just outstanding, and I uh, recommend them to you. And um, I believe those were the main housekeeping details that we needed here at the close. So I want to thank the uh, staff at the AMA for their work in putting this together, and thank each of you for attending, and encourage you to visit the uh, AMA's website and look at our webinar series. I tend to listen to a lot of these that are recorded, um, and suggest you might want to do that as well. And with that, uh, thank you so much for being with us today.